This is Dungonal Reservoir in the Antrim Hills in County Antrim. It is an artificial reservoir and it's a drinking water supply for the town of Ballymena and the surrounding area. It supplied North, Northern Ireland water run the reservoir and own the reservoir and they treat the water that supply, they supply to their customers and they supply approximately 7 megalitres or 7,000 cubic metres per day on average to the customers. So the reservoir itself measures approximately 30 hectares in area and at the moment because it's midwinter it's at capacity in other words the water level is at a maximum so any water that's coming in from upstream is basically getting discharged over the overflow and continues on downstream during the summer time this is often not the case and in actual fact this summer because of pro a prolonged dry period the water level was down approximately between a meter and a half and two meters depending on the time of year this is a problem because basically the reservoir needs to be able to store water for periods when we have little or no rainfall and during those periods we're basically supplying or we're relying on the water from the reservoir if we have streams that are su supplying the reservoir as we have here and they flow at a reasonably constant rate then our storage capacity doesn't need to be all that high on the other hand if the reservoir is relying on streams that are highly seasonal and at some stages dry up under those circumstances we need to have higher storage capacity now this reservoir is basically underlain by a bedrock aquifer the basalt bedrock aquifer and then overlying that there is the deposit here that you can see in the background this brown material which is basically peatland blanket bog to be more precise Blanket bog is really quite a rare habitat worldwide and the island of Ireland hosts about 8% of this. Now the bog itself is really quite unusual from a hydrological perspective because many people consider it to be a giant sponge which is holding water which releases gradually to streams and those streams then come into the reservoir and basically help to keep the water level high. The other element of this of course is that as you can see this is a mountainous area so there's very little in terms of pollution pressure in this area and as a result the water quality is really good. Um, that doesn't mean to say that the water does not require treatment. The water has colour in it which is derived from partially decomposed plant material and it's basically a technical term called humic acids. Those humic acids need to be removed before they're delivered to the customer and for that reason Northern Ireland has to, water has to treat the water in its treatment plant immediately downstream of the reservoir. And water have noted along with a number of other water treatment utilities around Britain and Ireland is that as the peatland is converted to other uses for example for forestry or it's drained and used for fuel the water quality in the streams that are draining the peatland also changes and what we actually see is that the levels of colour in the water increase. What this means for Northern Ireland water in this case is that they need to spend more money on treating the water and in doing that, that money, uh, that cost is transferred onto the customer. And what they've actually found is that it is in many cases more economical to leave this catchment that's supplying the reservoir in its natural or near natural state and in that way they can maintain the water quality and also maintain the stream flow and thereby the reservoir that we have behind us is actually fit for purpose over a longer duration. On the other hand if the peatland were to degrade what we would find is that the flow in the streams is often more flashy in other words we have more variable flow and what that means is that our storage capacity in the longer term particularly if we have prolonged dry periods in the summer that storage capacity needs to be higher the direct consequence of that is that the reservoir needs to be larger and so the current reservoir would no longer be fit for purpose. One of the crucial aspects in dealing with water supplies and particularly with reservoirs is knowing how big the reservoir needs to be and that depends on a number of things obviously to do with topography and the overall shape but critically it's also to do with the amount of water that's coming in and when it comes in, you know, the rate of delivery, if you like.
And what you will see is that generally speaking, if we have a highly seasonal climate, then under those circumstances, we need to have larger storage capacity. Now, we'll illustrate that now in a moment, but let's consider what we've just seen at Dungonal. And at Dungonal, what we observed was we had this catchment around the reservoir, and there are a number of streams that feed into the reservoir, and they basically provide water in many cases year round, but the flow rate varies enormously from summer to winter, largely because of hydrological processes. Now, what I would also add, just to complicate matters, just for the moment to remind you, is that we have external catchments as well that are then taking water and piping it into the reservoir. But for the moment, we'll just keep this simple. So here we have a diagram illustrating our reservoir at Dungonald with the treatment plant at the end supplying drinking water to Ballymena. Now, what we've got then, as I said, is we have our streams and basically, what we need to do here is look at the flow in those streams now, and then consider the storage capacity of the reservoir. Now, one of the reasons why Dungonal is so attractive as a water supply, well, there's a number of reasons, but one of them is that it rains an awful lot. You know, we get over a meter of rainfall here every year, but in addition to that, it rains frequently, it rains year round, and we'll see that that's actually going to be really quite important. And then the third element here, which we need to consider as well as water quality. And we'll come back to that shortly, but just for the moment, bear in mind that this is an area with very low intensity land use. Essentially, the area is largely used for grazing sheep. And so there are not very many pollution pressures. So we don't have to worry so much about water treatment compared to let's say a catchment in a lowland area where we may have intensive agriculture and intense industrial activity. So let's consider the situation here with our reservoir. Now the way that we can get an idea of the size is to look A at the demand and B the supply. So we're back to the whole idea of the flow balance again. Our input, which is the supply, and our output is the demand. And then we've also got our water level fluctuation, our change in storage. Now, it's the storage element that we're particularly interested in here how much water should we be able to store so that we can supply sufficient water to the customer and to do that we draw a very simple curve which is a cumulative curve of the volume in ml in this case is megaliters so that's millions of liters or if you like thousands of cubic meters and then we draw that with time going through the hydrological year and as we start off, we're going to start with something very, very simple here. We're going to assume that demand is constant throughout the year. Now, we know that that's not the case, but just to make things simple here, we're going to work with a constant demand. And what we'll see here is that the demand is illustrated by this yellow line, or this white line, I think it is, on your screen. And you can see that that increases linearly throughout the hydrological year. Now, at the start of the hydrological year, let's say a reservoir is full, it's at capacity, in other words, it's full up. So we're gonna get rainfall and that then basically translates into runoff that comes into the reservoir via, via these streams. But because our capacity, we're at capacity already, the surplus water is then discharged downstream. Now, as the year goes on, we then begin to reach a point where the supply is equal to the demand. And so what is coming into the reservoir via the streams and the, the diverted streams as well is equal to what the demand is. Now remember for Balamina we said that the demand on average is about seven megaliters a day. Now, after that, let's say we have a prolonged dry period. What we're going to see then is our demand outstrips the supply. Now a lot of these streams will continue to flow but they'll flow at much lower rates, basically because there's no quick flow element contributing to the flow in the streams. So we see what we're getting here is we're getting a deficit. So let's say we have a period with little to no rain. What we're seeing here is that the demand continues and we must draw the water from storage. And so that continues and that continues. And basically then we'll, get, we'll reach the end of our dry spell and then the rain begins again and we can basically begin to fill up the reservoir again until we get to the end of the year when we're back at capacity. Now that's a general idea. Now in terms of the storage, the storage is basically the maximum, at, at its very minimal uh, requirement, storage is going to be the largest 
deficit that we've got in the reservoir. Now obviously we'll put in a factor of safety as well on top of that, but basically provided we can meet that deficit, we can continue to supply demand at the required rate. So that very simple curve there gives you a pretty good idea of how big the reservoir should be. Now, if we take that a stage further, let's consider situations, for example, we have forecasts with climate change where we're gonna have drier summers and wetter winters. What that means is something quite important from the design point of view and economically, in that the supply here, the storage deficit, in other words, the supply during these prolonged dry periods is going to probably, it would start sooner, um, what that would mean is that we need to have extra storage capacity. Now that can be an issue, um, basically because if we don't have that storage capacity, we can't actually meet people's drinking water demands. Now, in certain parts of the UK, this has really become a problem and what people have actually looked at is actually building or raising the level of the reservoir. As you might imagine, this is an immensely expensive operation. So what we would like to do instead is look at means by which we could potentially stabilize the delivery of water through these streams and, channel and streams and rivers. And by doing that, we can then begin to reduce this storage deficit that we're projecting. And under those circumstances, we can actually save quite a bit of money because we don't have to build another reservoir or alternatively to redesign and upgrade the existing reservoirs. So this is the downstream side of the catch of the weir that's at the catchment outlet. And what you'll see here is something rather unusual. What you've got is all this water coming out of the stream, cascading over the weir, and then basically not contributing to the flow that's going on with, with the stream further downstream. Essentially because what's happened here is that the water is being diverted and has been taken off to feed into the reservoir, to Dungonal Reservoir further downstream. Now that's done through a pipeline system and basically this is one of the best streams that they have feeding into the reservoir. Now the question is what do I mean by one of the best streams? Well if you look a bit more closely at the water what you'll see there is that it has a slight brownish tinge. That brownish tinge is known as colour and we need to take colour out of water before it comes out in people's taps and that costs money. As it turns out, there are a number of streams that feed into the reservoir, but the color levels coming out of this particular stream are the lowest. And one of the reasons why the color levels are so low in this particular stream is because the peatland in the surrounding area that's contributing to the flow, or if you like, the catchment, is actually in very good condition. Elsewhere, the peatland is more degraded. And what has resulted, what has arisen as a result is that the water levels in the peat fluctuate much more than they do at this particular location and that fluctuation in water in the peat allows oxygen into the peat and it allows it to decompose more rapidly and one of the byproducts of the decomposition of peat is this color the technical term for this is humic acid so removal of the humic acids is a big challenge for northern ireland water and they spend hundreds of thousands of pounds every year treating the water that comes out of this particular stream and the various others that feed into the lake. Now, the other thing you can see here is the shape of the weir. As I said already, this is a compound pin plate weir. So what we see here is that we don't have a simple rating curve. Instead, what we have are rating curves that are superimposed upon one another. And as we go above the lowest notch, the stage discharge relationship will change. And once again, if it goes above the highest notch here, again, we see another change in stage discharge relationship. Now, fortunately, it doesn't go above that highest notch very often. But what you will see in the situation that we see here is that it would not take very much more for the water to actually, if the water to rise another four or five centimeters here, the capacity of the offtake to discharge water to the reservoir is basically overcome and the water is then diverted and continues downstream. So we don't actually capture all of the water, only the water that's basically able to 
flow through the pipe at maximum capacity. And that's really quite important because one of the other things we've noticed about colour is when the flow rate goes up, so does the colour level. And as a consequence of that, if we have very high colour levels and we would capture all of the water, we would spend disproportionately more money on treating that water. Okay, so here we are at the other end of the offtake from the weir that we saw earlier on. And what you'll see here is that we actually had a pipeline taking that water from the stream and conveying it all the way down to this, this structure here, this channel here, which will then discharge into Dungonal Reservoir. Now, what you'll also see here is below me here, we've basically got a flume which NI Water used to monitor the flow coming into the reservoir from this particular stream. And then linked with that, you can see we've got a telemetric system here as well that allows us to read that data in real time. So we can see what the flow is coming into the reservoir continuously around the clock at any time of the day, any day of the week. We're looking at an area here that's basically covered with a type of deposit called blanket peat. Blanket peat is basically organic matter that is partially decayed. It's plants that have partially decayed and the rate of decay is slower than the rate of the plant growth. So over time you get a net accumulation of vegetation and this partially rotted vegetation is what we call peat. So here's an example of some peat here that we've collected using this Russian sampler. And the nature of the peat can vary enormously. And this material, as you can see here, it doesn't look particularly pleasant, but believe it or not, it's actually quite sterile. And there's an awful lot of roots in this particular sample. Um, but at the same time, you can see that a lot of the plant material has decomposed. It's got this brown color. And if I squeeze that, it's considerable. Well, some, a small proportion of that is coming out through my fingers. It's basically become gelatinous. Now, the reason we're interested in this from a hydrological point of view relates back to this whole concept of specific yield and porosity. Peat has an enormous porosity. In actual fact, this particular sample here, if I took the equivalent volume of milk, there would be more solids in the milk than there actually is in the peat. Peat porosities are typically between 90 and 95%. So in other words, if you like, 95% water. It's an enormous amount. And a lot of that water is available for flow. In other words, it's part of the effective porosity. And that effective porosity then, if you think about this, all you need, if you take a small drop in water level, that actually counts for quite a large volume of water. So one of the hypotheses we have for this area is that the, the water that's stored in the peat, that's taken into the storage in the peat, gradually releases to the rivers and streams and it actually maintains stream flow. So in some places you'll hear people talking about bogs being sponges soaking up water. Now the evidence that we have for this is somewhat, um, uh, somewhat qu puts all that in into question basically because we need to consider something else which is okay we've got a capacity to store water bit like a bucket but imagine this if the bucket is nearly full there's no additional storage capacity and what we see from our groundwater monitoring here as well is that in actual fact the water table is very close to the surface so we have very little additional storage capacity and this is reflected in rainfall when we get rainfall events we get rapid responses in, in the in the rivers and streams in areas where there's abundant year-round rainfall such as on the Garan Plateau the vegetation responds and in particular what we see is we see the development of mosses and these mosses are very well suited to areas where we've got this persistently high water table and we have a sustained input of rainfall throughout the year as we often do experience in Ireland. Now the moss of particular interest when it comes to peatlands is this particular type of moss here. This is a sphagnum moss, there's a number of different species but Generally speaking, these mosses favour places with low nutrients, in other words, peat bogs that are in areas where they experience regular rainfall and lots of rainfall as low nutrient input. Now, sphagnum is quite remarkable in that it has a tremendous ability to do two things that are very important from a hydrological point of view. One of them is to transmit water. So sphagnum mosses are very, very permeable. So 
when we look at peat bogs, we often talk about an upper layer that's extremely permeable, the term being acrotellum. And this acrotellum layer basically can store and transmit large volumes of water and help to sustain stream flow. The other, unit, the other element to this is its capacity to store water as well. So here we have an example of some, some sphagnum moss and you can see already it's got this immense amount of water stored in it. And you'll really see this when I begin to squeeze it and the amount of water that trickles out of this. So from this small volume of, of moss, we've got a huge, huge volume of water. And in actual fact, the porosity of these sphagnum mosses, in other words, the proportion of the moss that is made up of water, in many cases exceeds 90%. So this is an extremely important species from a hydrological point of view, in that it stores water, and it transmits water on one level. But the other thing that it does is, it basically, by keeping the water table high, it maintains water quality as well. And these sphagnum mosses generally provide a very good water quality. And that's one of the reasons why Dungonal Reservoir is where it is. Basically because it's got lots of water, but that water is also of good quality. So essentially what we've got in a lot of these areas is uh, we've got really quite significant thicknesses of blanket peat. Now, typically if you look in the literature, they'll say anything from zero to three meters. But in actual fact, some of the measurements that we've made across this site suggest the peat can reach five, six meters at least. So what that means is that we've got an awful lot of water stored in this. But the other thing to bear in mind is that the, the material here that's making up peat is essentially organic carbon. So this is carbon that would have been in the atmosphere and has been taken out through plant growth. Now, the significance of this really becomes apparent when we start to think about the area that's covered. Basically, about 12 to 13 percent of the island of Ireland is covered by this type of peat. And then if we include other types of peat, it's approximately one fifth. You've got similar coverage in places like Scotland, parts of Northern England and Wales. So these are huge carbon stores as well. They are storing up large amounts of carbon and they're actually providing a service. They're helping to regulate the climate. On the other hand, if we damage these peatland ecosystems, what happens is that the carbon begins to, be, begins to decompose and be released to the atmosphere. And so this again is another reason, apart from just maintaining good water quality, it's another reason for basically looking after these areas. One of the issues that we regularly encounter when we're looking at peatlands and their hydrology is that the vast majority of peatlands in Britain and Ireland have been damaged by human activity. Most notably, that damage comes in the form of drainage. Now here we have an example of a drain. And what you can see here is very, very effective, very effectively is that what the drainage has done is it has lowered the water level. The water table in the peat should be naturally at this ground surface. Because of the presence of this drain, the water table has dropped below the ground surface. The vegetation that would naturally be present here, notably the mosses, that store and release the water cannot survive if the water table is below more than 10 centimeters below the ground surface for less than for more than a few days. So as a result of this drain, what we've seen is that the mosses have died back and in its place we've got some grasses, but by and large what we also have is bare peat. And that's a real problem from two perspectives. One is from the water quality perspective, because by dropping the water level, in the into the peat what happens is that the peat begins to decompose more quickly due to the presence of oxygen which is not normally present below the water table so that oxygen and that rapid decomposition results in the release of more humic acids and the water becomes more colored the other thing though that we'll see here is that there's a reduced capacity to store water as well um, and part of that is because of the surface. What you'll see here is we have a bare peat. So when it rains, instead of that water being stored in the mosses, what will happen instead is that the water runs off very quickly as overland flow. It enters into these drains and then it's lost. Whereas in a natural system, the water table would continue to, be, to remain high and the water would be released much more gradually. So we talk about a flashy runoff regime.
and that's particularly the case for damaged peatlands. What we see compared to intact peatlands is that the flow regime is far flashier. In other words, when it rains, the response to rainfall is much more rapid and the peak flow is much higher. So we've, in many cases, we suspect we're gonna have a greater risk of flooding because we have damaged the peatlands um, by putting in these drains. Okay, so let's take a look at what happens with drainage. Now, typically in peatlands, such as at the Garran site, what we'll see is that drains go in, there's a series of parallel drains that are installed. And remember what I said, we need to keep our water table very, very shallow, very close to the surface, if we're going to maintain the mosses that we need to keep water quality good, to, con to maintain that good level of storage and to basically keep stream slow, flow stable, particularly during tr prolonged dry periods. So what we, we actually can use some of the modeling that we've done so far in class to actually better understand what's going on. So here we have a situation where I have two drains and I've got an interval of peat in between. Now that peat has a hydraulic conductivity of K and we've also got a recharge rate here, Q. So effectively we're treating the peat as an unconfined aquifer. Now, if you remember from class, we have this basic differential equation to explain groundwater flow. Remember, that's one dimensional and in steady state. So we've got this 1D steady state flow, and we take our equation, we integrate it twice, and basically we come up with this equation here that you'll see at the bottom, with our two constants of integration, A and B. Now, when we apply our boundary conditions at x equal to 0, h is equal to h1, at x equal to l, h is equal to h2, we can then come up with this solution here. Now, if we were to take that and put that into XL, what we would actually see is as we vary x, the distance from drain h1, the drain with h1 to, to h2, Depending on the contrast in the water level, the hydraulic conductivity and the Q, the recharge rate, we generally will have various different water tape. We can get contrasting water table profiles. Now, where these two levels are e equal, essentially what we'll get is something like this. We'll have the water table rising up and that gives us something called a groundwater mound. Sorry. Now, what we can see here, I've tried to illustrate this schematically, but if this is our 10 centimeter, 10 to 15 centimeter target below ground, then clearly we have a large interval where the water table is not sufficiently shallow that it can allow mosses to survive. So what we've tried to do at Garan is basically to dam these drains so by damming these drains and bringing the water levels up, let's say to a new level, a new H1 if you will, let's call that H1 Rev or H1R and H2R, we can then calculate, if we know the hydraulic conductivity and we have an idea of the recharge weight, we can then get an idea of how much more of the area will be suitable to allow mosses to grow. And what we find generally is that the water levels will come up. Now the question is whether they come up sufficiently high. The big problem that we have here is that although the water levels will rise, the question is, is it sufficient? And that is our real objective. Not only to get those water levels to rise, but to get them to rise over a sufficiently large area. And then secondly, to then keep them at that level so that the mosses can survive. This is really quite a big challenge and it's something that we really haven't completely cracked at this stage. On the other hand, what we're seeing here is that we do have a reduced interval of water table fluctuation. So what that means is that there's less volume, there's a lower volume of peat that's available to be oxidized and to release organic acids, humic acids, which cause the color in the water. So, the objective here is partially achieved and we've actually seen that this has been successful in that respect. If we take a look at the information that we have for the, the water treatment plant over the past 10 years, for the first five years no dams were installed and as a consequence we had quite, a quite high colour levels. 
after those dams went in the water levels down the color levels went down and as a result the water treatment company northern ireland water have been saving money now that is something called an ecosystem service in other words it's something we're getting from nature if we look after the natural processes in the catchment in other words we maintain the bog in a healthy condition we reduce our water treatment costs and that saves us money so that's one big advantage of basically keeping this habitat in a good condition other advantages include a potential reduction in the flood risk and then linked with that then we have improved ecology improved biodiversity now that third aspect may not seem all that important but you need to remember that the condition of rivers the legal condition of rivers in britain and ireland is determined by something called the water framework directive and if the the ecological condition of the river declines in other words if we have a loss in biodiversity there's a legal obligation to restore that that can be a very very expensive operation and in actual fact in peat covered areas we don't know how to do that but one thing you can be pretty sure of is it's going to be pretty expensive so coming back to this whole idea we've basically started on the whole restoration program we still have quite a lot to learn and what we all particularly need to learn is the best way to dam these drains so that we can basically keep that water level high, restore the mosses and improve the colour of the water. One of the key elements of the module engineering hydrogeology, uh, engineering hydrology and hydrogeology deals with the acquisition of hydrological data and how to interpret that. Now, previously we used to do this through a field trip. Unfortunately, you've been not able to attend the field trip this year. So instead, we put together this film. Now, what we would have done in the past is we would have visited a water supply um, up not too far from Belfast, and we would have looked at the hydrology there and how that contributes both to the reservoir design, but also to the water treatment processes. So. We're going to try and reproduce some of that today and give you an idea of what basic, how important hydro hydrology is and understanding hydrology is to understanding the overall operation of the plant. Now, a crucial part of this relates to the flow balance. And just to remind you what the flow balance is, it's a very, very simple idea. It's a bit like our bucket. If you remember, we had our bucket before, excuse my drawing, where we've got a bucket full of water with a hole at the bottom leaking some water out and we've got water coming in at the top. So this is our input, this is our output and the change in water level that we might see in the bucket, that's our storage increase. Now we can translate that to any problem provided we know the time frame and we also know the area that we're dealing with now in this case what we're going to do is we're going to look at a particular catchment and we're basically going to put look at the flow balance there so to write this down as a mathematical expression we've got our input or our inputs minus our outputs and that's of course equal to increase in storage now for the area that we're looking at we basically we're going to select a catchment so what we mean by a catchment is an area within which all of the water will flow out in one particular direction and we're really not that concerned about the water outside so for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to draw a rough sketch of a catchment and we'll basically put in some very simplified assumptions just to illustrate what's going on. We will then deal with the whole issue of data acquisition and how to process the data. And then after that, we're going to give you some data in the exercise um, for, the, for the field trip. And it's up to you in your group to basically process that and come up with some conclusions. So let's start with a simple situation. Let's draw ourselves a very rough catchment outline. So let's say this is our catchment, which I'm dotting in. Now, remember that we may have water outside of this that's flowing away. 
we really don't care about that. All we're interested in is the water within the catchment here. And uh, Jim, what you'll see at this location is that the catchment is drained by a number of streams and all water within the catchment goes to those streams. And what we're making is a very crucial assumption that all of the water flows out via this catchment outlet, this point at the end of the stream here. So this is our catchment here. We're only interested in everything within that. So let's consider then this whole situation with the flow balance that we've got here. So our inputs in this situation, we have nothing coming in from outside of the catchment over land. So essentially the only input we have then is precipitation, which I'm gonna abbreviate PPT. That's our input. And then we've got our outputs. Well, the obvious output here is, I'm gonna put this in parentheses, is gonna be the runoff. So this is all of the water that flows out of the stream here. And then we've got another crucial output, which can be really, really important, but is unfortunately a bit more difficult to discern. And that's something called evapotranspiration. So I'm gonna E subscript T, I'm gonna call that. So this is our outputs. And that's going to be equal to a change in storage, which I'm gonna call Delta S. Now, in the catchment that we're actually dealing with, there are no lakes and ponds. So basically storage essentially consists of changes in the groundwater level. Now, there's another crucial assumption here that we need to pay attention to, which is we do not have water leaving by groundwater flow um, through the catchment outlet. In other words, we're saying all of the water that leaves, leaves through this particular point, this outlet for the catchment. And so that's what we're dealing with. Now, if we find that the groundwater level over the period of time that we're interested in does not change, in other words, the water level at the start and at the end is the same, then this becomes inputs, which is precipitation, minus our outputs, I'm gonna abbreviate runoff R.O, and then evapotranspiration. Now please be careful here, I've got the bracket here, so evapotranspiration. So that's equal to zero if we're in steady state. Now, this can become even simpler in some situations. Generally speaking, if we look at, this, if we look at what goes on, we've essentially, over the hydrological year, we've essentially got two periods. We've got that period that extends mainly from the end of March up until the end of September. And during that period, evapotranspiration here is a really important element in the flow balance. After that, what we see is that the importance of evapotranspiration declines and in many cases it becomes really quite insignificant. That's in part due to a number of things. One of those things, of course, is that we've got a reduction in temperature, but we also have a reduction in daylight. And both of those mean that plant growth really, really slows down and we have much lower levels of evapotranspiration. Now, it's tempting to set evapotranspiration to zero during this period, but you really need to check it. But if you can, if you find that evapotranspiration is is, is equal to zero or approximately, what you can say is basically precipitation is equal to runoff. And this is a very useful check when you're working during the winter period. To take a look at your total precipitation and then take a look at your total runoff and compare them to see whether the catchment boundary that you've defined is accurate. In other words, is this area, and the assumption that all of the water within this area flows out through this stream, or do we have water coming in here that we don't know about? Now, that might seem an easy thing to do, particularly in mountainous areas, but when areas are quite flat, that can be quite tricky. And um, we're going to look at that in a further presentation as part of this film. So, one of the things that we need to look at in the flow balance is the variation in the amount of water stored in the catchment. And in a catchment like this, where there's no lakes, within this catchment, what we need to look at then are fluctuations in groundwater level. And the way we do that 
is we install piezometers and monitoring wells into the ground and we measure the water levels and how they vary with time. So I've got a simple device here that allows me to measure the depth to the water table. So here's a piezometer. Basically it's a plastic tube with some holes in the end that allows water in to flow in and out. And I can measure the depth to the water table by basically placing this in the well, listening for the sound, and I now know that the depth to water is 50 centimeters below the top of the casing and my stick up here is 40 centimeters so I know my water table here is 10 centimeters below ground. Now the other thing I can do then is that's just a once off water level measurement. I can then compare that to the results that I get when I record the data automatically again using one of these data loggers. And this data logger is programmed to record water levels every half hour. So that not only gives me an idea of the variation in water level, but when it happens. So linking that to what I would get, let's say from an automated weather station, I can begin to see rainfall runoff relationships, a rainfall groundwater level relationships. And then similarly, I can look at flow rates in the stream and relate groundwater levels to flow rates in the stream as well to better understand the relationship between groundwater level and stream runoff. So that's one element of the, the idea of looking at groundwater. The other one is to get an idea of the hydraulic gradient. In other words, the slope of the water table. And to do that, we need more than one point. And what you'll see if you look around here is that we have a whole series of piezometers installed. Now, three of these monitor water table levels and because I know the elevation of the top of casing here from a previous survey that combined with the depth of the water table allows me to get the head in other words the elevation of the water table above sea level at each of these points and you'll see that these are laid out in an equilateral triangle using this information then I can put all the water levels from all of the piezometers together to get the hydraulic gradient, in other words, or should I say more accurately, the horizontal component of the hydraulic gradient. In other words, its magnitude and its direction. Now, the other thing that we have here is we've also got a piezometer here that has been installed and is screened down at the base of the peat. And what we notice with that is that the heads at the water table piezometers are consistently higher than they are at the base of the P. And that's indicating that we've got a downward hydraulic gradient. And the other thing that we can do with these piezometers is of course, measure the properties of the P. Most specifically, we can measure the hydraulic conductivity or how easily water will flow through the P. And to do that, we can use a number of methods. Given the nature of P, we, we generally use slug testing or associated methods. And here what I'm going to do is I'm going to use what's called a rising head method. I'm basically going to stick this tube down into the piezometer so that it's below the water table. And I'm gonna suck some water out. Um, and then I'm gonna monitor how quickly the water level rises back up. Now, what I've done in this case is I've taken the logger and I've programmed the logger to measure at one second interval. So I've got really high resolution data. So I'm gonna firstly put that in to the piezometer. I allow that to equilibrate with the water table because the piezometer or the logger itself will display some water. And once that's done, I'm gonna basically put in my tube here and suck out some water. And once I've done that, I can then let the logger record how quickly the water level rises back up. Using that information, in other words, the response to the removal of water and measuring that with time, we can then determine the hydraulic conductivity using the slug testing formula. The groundwater level data can be extremely useful for us in determining a lot of hydrological processes and a lot of ecological processes as well. You'll have seen from the presentation that measurement of groundwater level is relatively straightforward. Essentially, 
we place a device into a well and we measure the depth to water. Now, if we know how far the tube that we're using, the piezometer or the monitoring well, sticks up above ground, along with the static water level or the depth to water from the top of the casing, we can actually work out how deep the groundwater is below ground level. Now, taking that information in conjunction with data logger data, which can records water pressure continuously, we can actually use that to better understand the controls on water level fluctuation and why particular types of vegetation occur in particular areas. And that has clear implications as well for water quality and stream flow. So what we see here is we've got our device here, our, water, our data logger, and that's recording what I call the water column, WC1. So this is a water column at a particular time when I've also measured the static water level. Now, if I take my static water level data and my stick up data, I can get a depth to water. And you'll see from this equation that the depth to water is basically the static water level at time one minus the stick up. And that's equivalent to the water column that we've observed using the data logger. Now that's like we're calibrating the data. Once we've done that, we can then use that information and any changes in water pressure recorded by the data logger to actually work out how the depth to, of the water table below ground varies with time using this equation here where we have the depth to water level at this stage, at, at this, in this example at time two, indicated DTW2. And that's basically equal to the depth of water that we've measured when we were out in the field minus the increase in the water column. So in other words, as the water column gets larger, the depth to water declines. And so that's very, very useful because generally what we'll have is we'll have a plot of water column with time, which would be a direct readout from the data logger. But using this approach with Excel, what we can actually do is change that into depth to water with time. And we can see here that the, the water column has really increased quite a lot, so it's come very close to the surface. And that basically is telling us that the depth to water is getting very small. So in other words, instead of being, let's say, 10 centimeters below ground, it's one or two centimeters instead. Um, now, once we've got all of that information, we can take each of those points and Basically, we can use an equation that allows us to calculate what the probability is that the depth to water will be exceeded. In other words, that the water table will be greater than a particular depth. And that's basically taking all of our data, ranking our data, and then dividing that by the population size plus one, multiply that by 100, and that gives you your probability and the percentage. And you have that formula in your notes. So. Using that, we can get something like we have here at the bottom, which is a water level duration curve. And we can generate these water level duration curves anywhere that we have a data logger and a piezometer. And we have a number of points around the catchment where we have that. And that basically allows us to relate water level fluctuations to the type of vegetation that we, were, we see. What we can also do is, if you take a look at what we've got up here as well, you'll see that we have a hydrograph, in other words, rainfall with time, and we can see how the water level varies in response to the rainfall. And that's very useful because it gives us an indication of how streams, will, uh, how groundwater and stream water interact during flood events. Okay, for those of you who don't have the notes, the formula here for the duration curve, in other words, to calculate the probability of exceedance here, is going to be equal to the probability is equal to the rank that's going from highest to lowest, in other words, from deepest to shallowest, divided by the population size plus one, and then that's all multiplied by a hundred, and that will give us a percentage. Now, so we take those ranks Oh, we take those probabilities, we sort them in Excel, and we have a corresponding depth of water, and that allows us to plot the, uh, the curve that you see here on the bottom of the screen. Thank you. Okay, so what we've got here is a manual rain gauge. So these would have been the, the gauges that were most commonly used up until relatively recently.
before the advent of things like the tipping bucket rain gauge, which we'll see shortly. This device is really quite simple. It's basically just a cylinder here with a cone at the top with an area of a known diameter. So basically what we'll do here is we'll measure the volume of water that falls and you can see I've collected some rain here. And based on the graduated cylinder, it can work out what the volume is. And then from that, I can calculate how much rain has fallen, usually in units of millimeters per day. So these devices were advantageous because they were quite cheap, but at the same time, they were actually quite reliable. So the other thing that they've got, which is an advantage over the tipping bucket rain gauge, is you actually have a sample of rainwater. And if we're doing studies where we're looking at the quality of the rainwater as well as the amount then you will need something like this so I'm going to measure the electrical conductivity of the rainwater here by placing this probe into it this is an electrical conductivity probe and I've got a meter here and I'll turn on the meter this meter has already been calibrated and from this then I just have to wait a moment and then I can see from the meter here that my conductivity is actually extremely low as you would expect from rainwater and it's at about 13 microsiemens per centimeter now other things that we've used rainwater chemistry or rainwater for in this particular site at this particular site have included measurements of stable isotopes in other words the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen in water and the ratio of oxygen 16 to oxygen 18 in water and we can use that like a fingerprint race individual rainfall events because rain different rain showers will have different isotopic signatures and we can then look at the signature that we would get in river water and then from that we can work out how long it takes for rainfall to get from the land into the river now if you're looking at meteorological records and you're looking at daily meteorological records particularly going back let's say 40 50 years Virtually all of the measurements will have been made with these manual rain gauges and basically that would be done on a daily basis So every day somebody would come out measure the amount of rain that has fallen and from that then They would feed that into a network and we can work out the total amount of rain that has fallen over an area Now the big advantage of these if you have cheap manual labor or if you have people that are willing to do this is that these particular devices are extremely cheap and in actual fact you can make these yourself if needs be they're very very inexpensive to make um, so in this particular catchment at the very start of the research project we had three rain gauges just to look at the variability of rainfall around the catchment and in actual fact when we combined this with the automated rain gauges what we saw was that basically there was very little variation in rainfall across the catchment which isn't all that surprising because due to the size of the catchment which is just over one square kilometer here we have an example where we've got a rain gauge and we've left it out it's a manual rain gauge so essentially what we're recording is a volume of water that's been collected by the gauge over a period of time now what we need to do is to convert that into a total volume for the catchment so this is really quite simple we've got the volume in the gauge and we divide that by the gauge area. I'm gonna call that area subscript G. And that's going to give us a measure. So typically what we would have here is this will be in milliliters or cubic centimeters. We've then got the area of the gauge, which is in square centimeters. So that gives us, let's say centimeters or alternatively millimeters. Now, what we need to do is we take that information and we then convert that so that we can work out how much rainfall has fallen in the entire catchment. So it's just going to be the volume divided by the gauge area multiplied by the catchment area. And that will give us the, so the total volume of rainfall. Now, that's going to be in cubic meters or something similar to that. Um, now, the crucial thing here, of course, is to ensure that you've converted, let's say this is millimeters, you need to convert that to meters and your catchment area will be in meters as well. 
and then by multiplying those together, that gives you the, the total amount of rainfall. Now, there are two things that we need to consider in addition to this. One of them is, is this area that we're looking at, is that representative of the entire catchment? And what you'll have heard from the presentation is that in the past, we basically placed additional rain gauges in the couch catchment at different elevations. I'm going to dot that in there just as a contour line. And what we could then see, we we'll call that G2 and G3, and we we'll call this G1. And what we actually saw was the rainfall within the catchment from each of the gauges was pretty much the same. So that was really important because it tells us that the, the, the volumes that we're measuring with the rain gauge reflect the entire catchment. Now, that is not always the case. If you remember, we looked at different rainfall mechanisms, um, particularly where the elevation goes higher. What we see is with higher ground, we will get greater amounts of rainfall. And so you need to bear that in mind. And then the other thing is, I did give you a formula at the start of the semester, which will allow you to work out the minimum number of gauges per catchment. Now, this catchment that we're looking at here is quite small. It's just over one square kilometer. So under those circumstances, our gauge, considering the precautions that we've taken, that's basically adequate for our needs. Now, linked with that, there's a second crucial element here. And that second crucial element is, has our catchment boundary been adequately defined? In other words, is it correct? And again, this is a really pressing question because what we need to ask ourselves is, does the water outside this area here that we've defined contribute to the total stream flow? Or alternatively, are there areas within the catchment that we're saying contribute to stream flow and they actually go elsewhere? Now, what we should be able to see is by comparing the rainfall runoff responses, particularly when you look at the water, the groundwater levels as well in winter, when evapotranspiration is quite small, that gives you a good idea of whether the catchment boundary you've defined is actually appropriate or not. Um, now, in most cases, that you, know, you can just use topography and that's, that's adequate. Situations where that may not work, well, the first one of those is where the ground is very flat. It can be quite difficult. Secondly, if we have things like drains or if we have sort of underground tunnels, that will complicate matters. And then linked with that, then there's a third situation, which is a natural situation where we might have something called karst, where we have this limestone terrain with a series, a network of caves. And very often the conduits that are taking the water through the, through the, on the ground in a karst system, they crossed catchment divides. Now, this area, as I've said already, is underlain by basalt. So that's an igneous rock. It doesn't experience karstification. So we should be okay with that. This is the portable weather station that we have for the catchment. And this measures a number of quite important parameters that we need for our catchment flow balance. Most notably, it measures rainfall. So this is the tipping bucket rain gauge, which basically measures the amount of rain that's falling at a particular time and then records that. And then associated with that, we've a number of other devices here that allow us to determine the evapotranspiration or more precisely, the potential evapotranspiration rate. Some of these are quite obvious. For example, we've got the anemometer that measures wind speed here and the wind vane that shows us wind direction. And as you can see on today, a day like today, the wind speed is quite gentle. This is two meters above ground and facing north, and that's pretty much standard. In addition to that, then, we've a number of other devices in here that allow us to measure the humidity of the air, um, more precisely, the relative humidity. And using that relative humidity and that temperature data that we will measure here as well, along with the wind speed and the wind direction, and the final thing here, which measures a device that measures solar radiation, we can put all of that together and that allows us to calculate the potential of apotranspiration rate. Now, you'll notice that there's a number of boxes associated with this, and these are solar panels. So this is pretty much autonomous in terms of power, even in rather dull wintry days, a bit like today. And then this will record information at half hourly intervals continuously. So 
what I do here is I basically have programmed this to measure at half hourly intervals and then I basically come up every six to seven weeks and I'll download the data. Now, more recent devices have telemetric, me, telemetric devices that you can add on that allow you to access this remotely. Unfortunately, in this part of Northern Ireland, the phone signal is particularly poor. So as a consequence, we can't use that and we need to come up here and do this manually. But nonetheless, what we've got here is we've got, base, we've got data of potential evapotranspiration and rainfall data that extends back over three years. So it gives us a very good idea of the variability in evapotranspiration rate. And when we plot this up and look at it, what we'll actually see is that it's very, very cyclical. As we would expect when it's warm and the days are long and it's, it's, it's sunny, we have more potential evapotranspiration rate. So those summer days have higher potential evapotranspiration, whereas in winter, it's pretty much negligible and we know that from the flow balance because we look at the amount of rain that falls in the catchment and then we look at the amount of water that's flowing out as runoff at the weir it pretty much corresponds in other words there are no other significant losses in the in the flow balance as i've mentioned already one of the main outputs in the flow balance for any catchment in this part of the world is going to be potential or evapotranspiration now this is a particularly difficult thing to measure because most of the time it's based on the energy balance. So we're looking at energy coming in and energy going out. And then we combine that with some empirical terms and that allows us to calculate something called a poten potential evapotranspiration. Now remember that potential evapotranspiration is the evapotranspiration from a well-watered short green crop, in other words, grass, when there is no limitation on the availability of water. Once we reach a point called the root constant, if we're drawing water out of storage, after that the plants will begin to transpire. In other words, they'll begin to lose water at a rate which is less than the potential rate. But for the moment, we're going to work with potential evapotranspiration. So what you've seen is the weather station, and the weather station allows us to calculate potential evapotranspiration. So one of the, uh, one of the methods we use is the Penman method, and then there are derivations of that, such as the penman Grinley and the penman Monteith is another method which we use quite a lot, particularly in upland settings. It seems to work quite well. But more, going back to Penman more generally, what we have here is the equation, and I'm not going to go through the derivation of this, but what you'll see is that we have the potential evapotranspiration right there. And it's really a function of three things. The first thing here is the solar radiation, obviously with a bit of ground and with energy stored in the ground as well. So our solar radiation term. Then linked with that, we've got our wind speed and our vapor deficit. So the various devices that are on the automated weather station allow us to measure these terms and put those together to calculate the Penman uh, evapotrans potential evapotranspiration rate. And I'm not going to require you to do that as part of the exercise. I'll give you a potential evapotranspiration rate. But the thing you need to bear in mind is that that is not for well, that's for a uniform, well-watered, short green crop. In other words, it's for grass. The area that we're dealing with doesn't have that much grass, uh, of the grass that would, would be considered in the Penman equation in any case. So what we're dealing here are with different vegetation types. Now, we do have a way of dealing with this. Um, you will have seen in your notes, we have something called crop factors. In other words, the ratios of the potential of apple transpiration rate for different plants compared to grass. Now, as the name suggests, they would be crops, so things like maize and wheat and you know, uh, alfalfa, things like that. What we don't have in most cases are crop factors for wild vegetation, and that's something that we need to determine. And that can be really quite a challenge. So what we've actually done is up at the site at Garen, where we have our test catchment, we put in a series of what we call lysimeters. So these are self-contained devices. They I've drawn, tried to draw them schematically here. And what you'll see here is we have this tube that was pushed into the ground. You'll see this in the video. And essentially what that is, is it's thick wall plastic. It's been pushed into the ground around a volume of peat with 
the living vegetation on it as well. And then we put a tube into the lysimeter and that with a data logger in the tube, we can measure water level fluctuations. Uh, now, crucially, if you consider the flow balance, one of the things that we noticed was that flow out of the base of the lysimeter or into or out of the base of the lysimeter was essentially negligible when we put these things in. So the other elements here in any flow balance would be the lateral flow and, the, and then the evapotranspiration as the main outputs and then precipitation as the main input. So what you can see here is because we have the plastic uh, tubing here, we don't have any lateral flow. So essentially we've no lateral flow, we've no vertical flow. All we've got then is ev evapotranspiration and precipitation. And then with our water level measurements here, we can work out the change in storage. So once again, we come back to that very, very simple idea of the flow balance, but it allows us to calculate potential evapotranspiration rates. And what we can do is look at those over a period of time and then compare those to what we get with the weather station and then begin to work out crop factors. Now, the formula here gives us an idea of what's going on. Essentially, we've got our tube here and that's measuring the water level fluctuation in the lysimeter. So if we have a change in water level, which I indicate as delta WL here, if I multiply that by the area of the lysimeter here, A, and divide by the specific yield, I can get the volume change. Now, how do I get the specific yield? That's something that it has been quite challenging in the past. And again, remember something here that what we've got here is we've got water that would, no, we, would exp we were wondering whether water would flow out of the base of the lysimeter. It does not. So what we've been able to do here is we've been able to suck out a volume of water and then we cover the lysimeter. And by covering the lysimeter, we prevent evapotranspiration. So we suck out volume of water, we cover the lysimeter, and we allow the water level in here to stabilize. We know delta w, we know what the volume change here is. We've got the water level change as well, and we know the area, so we can work out the specific yield. So from one single simple formula, we can actually work out a storage term. And that is really, really quite useful because what we can then do is take a look at changes in water level over particular periods of time. And we can then actually say, right, we have had a drop of a water level of X across the catchment. That means that the storage has decreased by a certain volume. And the way we calculate that volume is using this formula here. What we measure with the portable weather station is the potential of evapotranspiration rate. Now, one of the things that we need to do is to be able to convert that potential of evapotranspiration rate into an actual evapotranspiration rate. And you'll remember from the notes that we have things like crop factors, etc., that allow us to do that. Now, the problem with crop factors is that crop factors are mostly, as the name suggests, developed for crops. Um, the vegetation that we're looking at here isn't the crop, yet we suspect that the evapotranspiration rate is different from the rate that we would have for normal grasses. So we need to be able to measure that and compare it to the potential rate. And one way we do that is using this rather well camouflaged device here, which is a lysimeter. Now what you'll see here is that this is a 20 centimeter diameter plastic ring. Now, You've got about five centimeters of that sticking up above ground, but we've also got about 45 to 50 centimeters below ground. And what we've also got in here is a tube. And this tube allows us to measure groundwater levels. And what we can do with the lysimeter is we can basically put in a data logger here and measure the water level fluctuations. And from those water level fluctuations, we can then work out the evapotranspiration rate, the actual evapotranspiration rate. Now, one of the concerns with these lysimeters at the very start was that a lot of the water would leave through the bottom of the lysimeter. However, when we first, first put these in, we did some falling head tests. And what we noticed was an actual fact that when we put the water in, it basically didn't flow out of the bottom and it was pretty much impermeable to all intents and purposes at the base. And what that meant was, if you think about this from a flow balance perspective, 
The only inputs could be precipitation because this is up above the surrounding so it doesn't get any overland flow. And the only output could then be the evapotranspiration rate. And so we measured the water level in the tube here. Then we needed to calibrate the water level in the tube. And what I meant by what I mean by that is we would basically use something like a simple suction pump. We would place this into the tube and suck some water out. When we suck that water out, we would observe a drop in the water level. And we could then, once that had stabilized, determine what the specific yield was. In other words, we can work out how much water is stored in the peat. And if we have, let's say, for example, a two centimeter drop in water level, because we've calibrated against these devices, we can then work out what that two centimeter drop in water level means in terms of actual water loss. So up until now, we haven't really looked at the issue of storage that much apart from using the lysimeters. But there's, this is actually quite important, not only in terms of water flow, but also in terms of water quality. In other words, how good the water is for, for, for human consumption. Is it fit for consumption? Or alternatively, do we need to do some additional water treatment? Now, one of the issues that we see in the Dungonal area is, although there's very little pollution pressure, we still have a need to treat water. If you remember from the film, the water that was coming that we see in the stream is actually quite heavily coloured and that can, we can't have that coming out of people's taps. So that needs to be removed. And very often that's a very expensive operation. So what we, we need to do is we need to spend money on water treatment and chemicals and that consumes a lot of energy. It requires extra manpower and it also requires disposal of the sludge at the end. So this can become an extremely expensive activity. So the alternative approach to this is something called SCAMP. Sustainable Catchment Area Management Plans. And essentially what this does is it basically says, look, if we look after the area where we're getting the water from, and what we, what's called the raw water quality before it's treated, we can reduce our treatment costs and in doing that we save money. So the question then is what steps should we take to improve our water colour? Well, one of the ways we, need, we look into what are the appropriate steps is to look at those areas in the catchment where we have low colour levels and where we have higher colour levels. And generally what we'll find is in areas where we have a healthy coverage of sphagnum moss growing, the water colour tends to be lower. Um, this layer of, this living layer of moss basically occurs in those areas of the bog where the water table is always within 10 or 15 centimetres of the ground surface. Now that might sound like an easy thing to do, but remember it needs to be within 10 to 15 centimetres of the ground surface to keep the mosses alive, even during those prolonged dry periods. So for those of you who were here last summer, you will remember the period from April up until the start of June. We had very, very little rain indeed. And basically a large area of the site dried out. Those areas that had these areas of moss coverage, they continued to have basically low water color, which is one of the things that the water companies want. Now, when we put in things like drains, what that does is it lowers the water level so we'll see a schematic diagram of a drain here and we've reduced the water level here in the peat and by doing that the mosses can no longer survive so a capacity to storm water in the mosses is significantly reduced but in addition we have this large interval of water table fluctuation which we didn't have before. And what that does is it allows oxygen to come into the peat and to begin to decompose the peat. Now from a water treatment point of view, that's a bad thing because what that means is that we have partial decomposition of the peat, the water becomes more colored, and as a consequence, more money needs to be spent on treating that water at the catchment outlet uh, where the water treatment plant is. So one of the ideas that we have for SCAMP now is in those areas where we have drains, what we want to do is we want to raise those water levels again. And that's something I'll look at shortly.
flow gauging in channels that are quite narrow and have turbulent flow can be quite challenging using things such as using standard methods such as the, the handheld flow meter, particularly when flows are high and we have the risk of, well, we have health and safety risks. It's simply not possible to go in and do hand gauging under those circumstances. Similarly, the whole issue of turbulence makes many of the assumptions with the depth discharge method somewhat questionable. So we prefer to use other techniques and dilution gauging is one of those techniques which is really very suited to measuring flow in small, turbulent and fast flowing streams. So the idea behind this is basically we have a flow in the stream with a certain water quality. It's got a certain concentration of a particular, con a particular constituent and we call it that concentration is CB. So what we then do is that CB level should typically be very low. What we can then do is add some tracer with a concentration CT, tracer concentration, which is a lot higher. And by mixing that with the stream water, just because of the natural flow processes and the turbulence, we can measure a concentration downstream and calculate what the original flow in the what the flow in the river is. Now there are two ways to two main ways to do this. One of these ways is to basically use a device where we pump in a constant amount of tracer at a flow rate small q. So we've got CT times small q and that then mixes with the water and then over time we can measure a concentration downstream and we get something like this which is indicated up at the top here. Now this is what's called a breakthrough curve and what we're looking at here is we're seeing the concentration uh, with time and you can see that at, after a particular period of time the, the concentration becomes constant. Now the other way to do this is what we call the slug method where we basically have a bucket full of tracer uh, we know the volume and we dump that in and we'll basically get a breakthrough curve that's somewhat different to basically a mound like this. So looking at these two approaches, um, we have some options here. Now the issue we have with the, the constant injection, con uh, the, the injection of a constant, uh, the in constant rate injection of tracer into the river is that it's actually quite hard to inject something at a concentration, constant concentration over time. You need a specialized device. Um, instead, so that might be a pump or it might be something called a Marriott vessel. Um, both of these things tend to be quite bulky. On the other hand, if we can get away with using basically a bucket with some tracer and we put it in, we are in a much better position. But either way, both of those methods are really quite effective for allowing us to determine what the flow is. And so there are two formula that we use for the constant concentration. So our constant flow. This is essentially a flow balance. So we've got the flow in the river, QR, and times we'll call it QR, and then we've got the background concentration, CB. So that's our concentration. So that could be something like chloride, or it could be something like electrical conductivity, which, which is very easy to measure, and which was what we used, which we've used up at the, uh, the site. So we've got that going in, plus we've got the flow rate here, the small flow coming from the reservoir of tracer with a concentration CT. Now, Crucially, downstream, we have only gone a short distance downstream, but it's sufficient to allow us to measure fully mixed flow. So the flow downstream is going to be the flow from the river plus the flow from the device. In other words, there's no additional water come in along the length of the channel, and that's going to be so those multiplied by what I call COBS the observed tracer concentration with time. So hopefully what you can see there is that we can rearrange that. If we multiply that out, what we get is QR times CB plus Q times CT is equal to QR times COBS plus small Q times COBS. And we can then rearrange that so that we'll bring all of the small flow terms to one side. So we're going to have Q times 
CT minus COBS is equal to QR times COBS minus C, the background, CBKD, or I think I just have it as CB here. Now, so if we divide that across, what we'll see is that QR is going to be equal to the flow rate coming out of the device, and that's going to be times CT minus COBS divided by this term here, so that's COBS minus CB. So what you actually see there is just from measuring my flow rate coming out of the reservoir and measuring those three concentrations, I can then work out what the actual flow is in the river. So this is, this is COBS here. Now, that is quite useful, but as I said, because of the nature of having to have a vessel or a pump to pump in at a constant rate, it's really not practical in a lot of cases. And most of the work we do, we do with very simple instrumentation. So in this case, we have the slug test. So we basically just dump in a known volume of trace of V, and that has a concentration in here, of course, as before, CT. And we can get the flow simply from the integral of this curve here. So that's going to be flow is going to be equal to, and we're going to have C0 times the volume, and that's going to be divided by the integral of the concentration with time. And hopefully what you'll see there is that that actually gives you your flow as well. Now that technique is really good. The main precaution to take under those circumstances is when you're injecting the volume, the volume of water, in other words, the flow rate coming from this has to be negligible compared to the total flow rate in the river. But in most cases, that's actually quite reasonable. So this is a really useful technique as well. So we've got both of those methods then to use. Um, now, I prefer this method just simply because it's easy. All I need is a bucket, some tracer, which is salt. Um, and a conductivity meter and allows me to do those measurements as you'll see in the film. So I then do that. The other thing that I need to note here every time I do this is I need to know H, the depth of water in the river. And I usually have something like a staff gauge that allows me to record that. So then with my depth of water and my staff gauge, remember the formula that we had, Q was equal to B H to the N. So if I plot log Q against log H, I should get something like that. And so that then is my rating curve. And I'm going to deal with the rating curve and how we actually use the rating curve to determine flows and volumes in the next session. So we're at a location now that's approximately 20 meters upstream of the, the out, catchment outlet where we saw the weir. This location is particularly useful because what we've got here is we've got a lot of turbulence in the stream water and that's valuable because what it allows us to do is to measure the flow in the stream using dilution gauging. And to remind you what dilution gauging is, it's basically injection of a tracer or basically pouring a tracer into the stream and then looking at the response downstream after it's fully mixed. And because of the reduction in concentration, we are able to work out what the flow rate is in the stream. So here I have a sample of stream water that I've just collected in a bucket. And what you'll see here is, firstly, if I dip the jug into this, this will hopefully give you a much better idea of the colour of the water. Now if you were to imagine that coming out of your tap at home, most people would be quite upset, particularly if they were going to do their washing in it. So as you can see, this is the stuff that Northern Ireland water needs to get out, this humic acid that I've mentioned already. So we've basically got that water. If we turn on our conductivity meter here, 
and let that stabilize. <clears throat> what we'll be able to see is that the electrical conductivity of this water is extremely low. So if you take a look here at the third value from the top, you can see that we're reading an electrical conductivity value of between 55 and 56 microsiemens per centimeter. Now, by way of comparison, if we were to take water out of the ground from, let's say, a limestone aquifer, our electrical conductivity under those circumstances would probably be of 10 times higher than that, between 500 and 600. So this is really quite low. Um, it's actually, it's slightly higher than rain because what we've got is we've got some humic acids released as well to give us not only the colour but also contribute to the electrical conductivity. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to basically put this water back into the stream. But before we do that, we're going to mix some tracer into the water and basically change its chemical properties. And the tracer I'm going to use is actually table salt. And I'm going to pour some of this table salt in and mix this up. And we're going to keep an eye on the value on the meter as I mix this up. So I'm going to place this meter on the ground um, I'm now going to add some of the table salt. Now, you take a look at the value there. We're going to mix this up. And you should see that we already we're going to get quite a significant change in electrical conductivity. So we've already gone up into the 700s here. We're up at getting on for almost 2,000, just over 2,000 now. And the reason why this is changing is that the water is still dissolving the salt. So I'm gonna stir this up a bit more to make sure that it's reasonably uniform. After that, I'm going to take a fixed volume and we're going to inject this into the stream while further downstream, we're going to be monitoring the electrical conductivity of the stream water and we record what's called the breakthrough. In other words, the arrival of the tracer. And from that information, we're able to work out the flow using, tidal, or using dilution gauging methods. So I take a look here, and I'm going to measure my conductivity again. And I see that, if I let my value stabilize, we're up at about a thousand, well, 2,000, we're over 2,000 now. And that's going to keep changing for a moment until it all stabilizes. I'd like that to ideally be a bit higher, maybe three or four thousand. So I've added some additional salt and I'm going to stir that in again. And we should see the conductivity increase once again. Now, so here you can see that that's really quite good. We're up at basically, we're almost at. 5,000 there, we're just over 5,000 now. We'll let that stabilize for a moment. And then what we're going to do is we're going to inject that solution into the stream and measure the conductivity for the downstream. So this is the outlet of the catchments that we're looking at. And basically what we've got here is a compound thin plate rectangular notch weir, quite a mountain. But essentially what this allows us to do is because it's got its constant cross section, we can develop a stage discharge relationship. In other words, we can look at the water level, or more specifically, the height of the water above the lowest notch in the weir, and then relate that to the discharge by a relationship that we determine using a rating curve. In other words, we measure flows at particular stages and then using that information, we can work out what the discharge is. Now, for the measurement of the stage, what we will do is we can do that in a number of ways. One of the ways is to do that manually, and here you'll see a gauging board, this meter stick, and this basically gives us the height of the water, or the depth of the water, if you like, but the height of the water above the lowest notch in the weir. And so, when we come up, we regularly measure that. Now that's just giving us a point measurement. Of course, what we need is we need a continuous measurement of discharge. What is the flow coming out of the stream all of the time? And to do that, we use some other devices. These devices allow us to do that. 
what we have here are data loggers. So this data logger, can you zoom in on that, Captain? Yeah. This data logger basically allows us to measure water pressure. We can program these data loggers to measure, and in this case we're measuring every half hour, but in some cases we can measure every 15 minutes or even every few seconds if necessary. But basically we'll place this in this tube here, which we call a stilling well, and once it's submerged, we can basically measurements of pressure. With the manual measurements that we take using the gauging board, we can then relate the water pressure to the depth of water. Now, a crucial complication of this is that the device is fully submerged and it measures the pressure. But that pressure also includes atmospheric pressure, in other words, the air pressure. And of course, that varies. So what we also have is a second device that measures the atmospheric pressure. So with the measurement of the atmospheric pressure, we can subtract this from the total pressure measurement, and that gives us the stage in the, in the river. In other words, the pressure of the water column alone. Now, in this particular catchment, we also have something else which is quite unique. We are also continuously measuring water quality. So, what we've got is we've got stream water here coming from a peatland which is typically assumed to have very low electrical conductivity, reflecting low potent dissolved solids, a low ion content, and it's also quite acidic. Now, to look at that and to see if that is the case, we can continuously measure the water quality using this device. And again, this is a data logger with a little contraption at the top here that may continuously measures the electrical conductivity of the water. And again, we're measuring every half hour. And the findings from this have been really quite surprising because what we found, in fact, is that with this particular device, we see an inverse relationship to flow. In other words, when the flow is high, the electrical conductivity is low. And when the flow is low, we have a high electrical conductivity, which in many cases could be four or five times the electrical conductivity during high flow or during a flood event, if you prefer. Now, using the information from this device, coupled with the information about groundwater quality, we can actually work out what the contributions from groundwater from deeper water that's coming up from below the peak and from the peak water are together and how they vary in contributing to the total flow in the river. Okay, so to continue with this idea of measurement of runoff, let's take a look at what we actually get. Now you'll have already seen we had a weir and we basically had a device in there, a data logger, and that data logger allows us to measure the depth of water or the stage, if you like, in the channel continuously over time, well semi-continuously every 20 minutes. So if we were to take that data and then we correct it, um, we can plot up the stage with time and we'll get something like this plot here. Now that's, that's useful but we can do a lot more with this because we have the rating curve which allows us to understand the relationship between stage and discharge as we see here we can combine the data we have here. So for example, I take a point there, I have a particular stage, and I can read that off and that's a given discharge. And I can do that for a whole series of points all along here, and taking each of those and using the equation of the line from the rating curve, I can then actually generate a plot of flow with time. And this is what we call a flow hydrograph. This is really, really very important in hydrology. Now, that allows us to plot up our flows with time. We can do a lot of other things then with this. One of the other things that's normally done is you plot rainfall with time. And you can see here, I've got my hydrograph, my plot of rainfall with time, plotted on the same time axis. And then what we can see here is we have our rainfall, and then we get a response to rainfall and we have terms such as the time to peak, which is the time between the maximum rainfall and the peak discharge, and there's some various other terms such as recession, which is the decline and flow after the peak, and then this is called the rising limb here. Now, very usefully, what we can also do here is we can also 
basically work out how much water has been lost because of a particular rainfall event. In other words, over a given period of time, how much runoff has gone over our, our, our flow measurement device, in this case over the weir. And that's really quite easy to do. We basically, we have our discharge, we have our time, so we just basically get an integral of the flow with time, and that gives us the volume. Now, for a given flow balance, let's say we're looking at a flow balance over a certain period, let's say a month or whatever, we'll take all of our flow data, we'll then basically integrate that, and that gives us a volume. Now, if you remember from the flow balance, what we actually had was we have inputs, which is precipitation, that's often in millimeters, and then our outputs were evapotranspiration, again in millimeters. Now, the issue that we have here is, of course, that we're basically measuring flows instead. Uh, well, we've, we've measured a volume after we've integrated the flows, but it's a very, very large amount, and it's in cubic meters. So what we need to do is we need to have common units. Now, one way to do that is, as I've showed you already, which is the, you can take the rainfall, and you can take the evapotranspiration, convert that to meters and multi multiply that up and multiply it by the catchment area in square meters. Alternatively, if you want, you can work in millimeters and we very often talk about something called flux. And flux is basically going to be equal to the discharge Q over the area. So it's basically the flow per unit area. Um, we can do a similar thing with the volume here in the flow balance. We can get the volume of the entire catchment divide by the area and that generally is a figure in millimeters so if we're looking at a period of say a month for the catchment we'll take all of the rainfall we'll sum that up all those millimeters and basically we have our rain as our inputs as rainfall we can do the same thing for evapotranspiration over the same period of time and then basically we can do the same thing here with the runoff and putting it all together looking then at the change in water level we can then begin to understand the, the flow balance be a bit better and the capacity of the ground to store water. Now, what we see, particularly in peak catchments, is that we have huge specific yields. Now, specific yield for things like fractured rock is often of the order of you know, less than 1%. In peat, it is very, very large. Some of the measurements that we've done have ranged from 30 to 60%. We have huge amounts of water stored in the peat. So what that means is that if we have available storage, in other words, if we have a low groundwater level and it rains, that water can go in and be stored in the peat and then released gradually. On the other hand, if our peat is in a bad condition, uh, we don't have that storage capacity, or alternatively, if the water table is at the surface and we don't have any storage capacity that way, when it rains, <clears throat> what we'll see will be a very rapid response in the stream. And that's exactly what we see. If you take a look at the hydrographs that you'll generate from the uh, from stream flow um, for the catchment, you'll see that in summertime we'll have rainfall and we will get a response in the stream. In other words, we'll see a rise in the, in the stream discharge rate. But compared to the same amount of rainfall falling in winter, it will be much less, basically because a larger proportion of the water has gone into storage and is basically, you know, basically been buffered. So what we see is that in the summertime, if we have intense rainfall events and we have available storage in the peat, we can often reduce the effect of flooding downstream. Alternatively, if the water table is at the surface, we don't have that extra storage in the same way that we would have a bucket that's completely full of water. If we add more water, it just can't it can't go in so we we don't have a capacity to store and under those circumstances we'll get much more of an impact downstream in terms of flooding similarly in winter time because we have so much so much less evapotranspiration what we'll see under those circumstances is that the river basically will just try you know we'll have rainfall and we'll have a very rapid response in the river and a much higher fl flood peak so this has been quite controversial because some people have said that the, the areas, these bogs that we look at are like sponges. They soak up water and they prevent flooding downstream. But you need to bear in mind, once again, that simple idea of the flow balance underpins this whole concept of whether flooding will happen or not. If there's available storage, 
under those circumstances the bog will act as a sponge if you will and will prevent the uh, well will reduce the effect of flooding downstream if that storage isn't present that will not happen so hopefully what you can see there is that the condition of the bog is important for determining the flood risk now what we also see is in areas where the peat has been degraded through drainage, for example, or for burning of forestry, etc. Very often under those circumstances, the effects of flooding are much greater downstream. So one of the issues that we look at here is whether it's more financially more worthwhile just to leave the bulk as, a, as it is, do not change it, and be, or alternatively to restore it to its natural condition, where it can soak up more water and release it more gradually. And if you remember from the very start of the presentation, that was really a crucial requirement if we wanted to increase the uh, basic, if we want to have the reservoir fit for purpose downstream. In other words, we've increased the capacity to store water within the catchment. And by doing that, we basically can allow streams to flow more stably into the, into the, into the reservoir. And as a consequence, we don't have to increase the reservoir storage capacity. So in hydrology, very often, we can't be completely certain of what flow will be over a given period of time. It's a bit like weather forecasting. We we're not too sure what the flow will be in two or three weeks time. However, one way we can deal with this uncertainty is with statistics. And what we can do is we can look at flow records and from those flow records, we can work out a probability that a given flow will be exceeded. So here I have an example, just ignore the green line for the moment and focus on the blue line. This is a hydrograph where we've got flow with time. And what you'll see is we've got these various different things happening here. We've got sort of what we call a recession, our decline in flow. We've got probably a response to rainfall here. We've got a peak. We've got these flow peaks. And if we look at that over a long enough period of time, we can start to compile the data together and get the probability that a given flow will be exceeded. And we can put together what are called flow duration curves. And with flow duration curves, what we'll do is we'll take all of the flow data, we'll put it all together, and then we'll work out what the probability of its exceedance is. So we've got this probability, which I'm going to express as a percentage. And that is basically going to be quite a simple a uh, simple equation, we've got all of our data, we rank our data from highest to lowest, and so we then have our rank, pardon me, rank, over the population size n plus 1, and then multiply that by 100. So we can, this is something that's really easy to do in Excel. You basically rank all of your data, you then rearrange the data from highest to lowest, and you then plot the probability here against the discharge rate. And this gives us a flow duration curve. And what you'll see is you should get something like this where you've got the probability of extremely high flows being exceeded. So this is probability of exceedance. As a percentage. And what we'll see here is that at those very high flows, we have a very low probability of it being exceeded. But as the flows come down, what you'll see is that the probability of exceedance increases and increases. So these curves are very, very useful, particularly if you were to take the ratio, very often we'll take the 5% to 95%, uh, well, pardon me, we'll take, here we are, 5 and 95, or alternatively we can take some other values here. We take these ratios, and from that, we can work out how flashy the stream is. In other words, how quickly it responds to rainfall and how much variability we have in flow. Generally speaking, what we'll see is that streams that have more gradual, sort of, uh, that are less flashy, have a, have a larger groundwater input if they're not in catchments where there's lakes. Lakes have a very strong stabilizing effect on flow as well, but basically, we have that we have a much more stable flow condition under those circumstances and generally speaking the ecology in the rivers and streams is also better under those circumstances as well
On the other hand, if we've got a very flashy catchment, what we'll see is that we get these very rapid responses to rainfall. So we'll have a very small amount of flow in the stream that will change very quickly. And in many cases, the streams will dry up. Now, as you can imagine, streams that are drying up are bad news for the reservoir storage capacity. So one of the things that we're trying to do with maintaining conditions in the catchment is to stabilize stream flow. And if we can stabilize or improve the stability of stream flow, we can also improve the, uh, st the overall utility of the reservoir. One of the other things that piezometers allow us to do is to measure ground, to take samples and measure groundwater quality. Now, some of these parameters that we measure with groundwater quality can be measured in situ. In other words, we don't need to take samples out of the ground. But in most cases, what we'll do is we, when we come to a piezometer, we you typically pump out three to five well volumes of groundwater in this case, and then we allow the water quality to stabilize. In other words, we've got some water that's in the tube that may not be representative of the surrounding material. So to deal with that, what we'll actually do is we'll pump that out and allow fresh water to flow in. Now, one of the things we can do here is we can measure things like the temperature, the conductivity, and the redox potential. Now there are fancy ways of doing this with things like flow cells, but in this case what we're essentially going to do is we're going to basically place the probe into the well just to get an idea of the water quality. And I place the probe in and I'm going to turn that on. And again, what we're going to measure here is we're going to measure temperature, specific electrical conductance. So in other words, that's the conductance or the electrical conductance of the water if it were at 25 degrees. In other words, the meter does the thermal correction for us. And what I'm seeing here is I'm getting an electrical conductivity of the water of 27.2 microsiemens per centimeter, which is quite low. And then I've also got a temperature of 6.4 degrees and a pH, which is really quite low, of 4.5. And that's really quite typical. Those conditions, those water quality conditions, are quite typical for bogs that are just fed by rainfall. So I'm now going to remove that and I'm going to place this tube into the well, which is attached to a rather large syringe. And through suction, I'm going to collect a sample here for water quality. Now you'll notice that I've sucked up a certain amount of water here that's in the syringe. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rinse my sample bottle first with that just to ensure that there's no cross contamination and once i've done that i will now take the sample that i'm going to return to the laboratory and analyze so i have a little valve at the top here i suck in the water through the suction device close the valve and then basically inject the water into the sample bottle. I'm going to repeat that so I have enough sample for my analysis. And then once I've done that, I will take the sample back to the laboratory. And in this case, I'm going to analyze the water for color and compare it to the color levels that are in the stream. And using this water quality data, along with the hydrological and hydrogeological data, I can actually get an idea of the contribution made by the peat water to total stream. Geology is to understand how peak flow occurs. In other words, how does flooding occur? And what are the sources that are contributing to it? Um, more critically, very often what we want to understand is what the groundwater contribution to flow is. So one of the ways we can do this is by using water quality. And it's actually really quite useful to use water quality to better understand uh, hydrological processes. So you'll remember from the film that you've seen that we basically have a device that measures the electrical conductivity of water in the, at the weir um, and at catchment. So we record that electrical conductivity, which I've illustrated schematically here as a green dotted line. And you can see I've got another axis here on the, on 
the second y-axis. So taking the peak flow, what we can do is we can look at this in a bit more detail. And by taking the conductivity data, we can do something called end-member mixing analysis, EMMA or EMMA as we call it for short. And what we're saying with EMMA is that the concentrations of a particular constituent in water come from two reservoirs and they are the two reservoirs that are contributing to flow in the river. And the variation in flow that we observe is a consequence of differing, contra differing relative contributions from each of those reservoirs. Now, generally speaking, we talk about two, those two reservoirs as base flow, which is very often equated to the flow coming from groundwater, particularly, um, it's actually the only flow in a stream during prolonged dry periods. So we've got that base flow, um, and then we have another element which is called quick flow. I would add that base flow can come from lakes if there's a lake in the catchment, but there isn't in this case. Quick flow is basically that overland flow and that shallow subsurface flow, that, if you will, that interflow, if you like. And we've lumped that all together. And what we're basically saying here is with Emma, we've got those two reservoirs and they're contributing to flow jointly. Um, particularly during the storm events such as that one presented here. And what you'll see here is at the very start of the storm event, essentially all of the flow is base flow. It's all coming from groundwater. <clears throat> As the storm proceeds, we get shallow water coming in, um, be that from overland flow or from interflow. And essentially that has a different chemistry and that chemistry causes the change in the conductivity uh, that we observe at the weir in our runoff record. So let's take a look at how we can actually calculate the contributions from groundwater, the base flow, and the contribution from quick flow. So we start off with this rather simple equation here, where we're basically saying that the product of the conductivity of the base flow multiplied by the flow coming from the base flow, in other words, the, 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 the base flow contribution, plus the quick flow electrical conductivity times the flow from the quick flow, that would give us total flow we observe that we can measure at the hydrograph using the hydrograph times the electrical conductivity we observe at the stream at the at the weir so we've got these two terms which we know and we can take samples of base flow and quick flow so essentially we've, we're stuck with two unknowns here we've got our base flow and our quick flow we've one equation and two unknowns but we do have a second equation and crucially what we're saying here is that the flow is equal to the quick flow plus the base flow plus the quick flow and so if we take that and rearrange that we can say that the quick flow is equal to the total flow minus the base flow putting that back in here to this equation we get this line here and hopefully what you can see there is we can rearrange that and we can have all of the base flow terms on one side and all of the total flow terms on the other side and then we can basically manipulate that to allow us to calculate the base flow here. Now this is really very, very useful because the, the conductivities are things that are easily measured in the field and we also have the flow from the hydrograph. So putting that all together allows us to calculate that base flow component that we see here. And then once we have that base flow component, we also have our total flow as well. And so we can then use this equation here to work out what the quick flow is. And that allows us to generate a plot such as the hydrograph that you see here, where at any time we can say how much water is actually coming from base flow and how much is coming from quick flow. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the field trip. Um, in terms of your assignment, what I would like you to do is to i'm going to provide you with some data and i'd like you to do a flow balance now in that what i would like you to do is look at your catchment area look at your precipitation and your runoff they are both reasonably reliable parameters and so you should be able to use those quite confidently similarly the storage or if you like the specific yield a subscript y we're reasonably confident that that lies between 0 0.2 and 0 0.6. So by looking at the water level fluctuations over a particular area, we can then use the specific yield and we can calculate a volume change, change in storage. So I'm going to give you a particular period of time that I'd like you to look at. And I'd like you to generate a flow balance 
and to calculate the, the biggest unknown here, which the thing that we're most uncertain about here is the evapotranspiration. I want you to calculate that evapotranspiration and then compare that rate to the rate that's actually given by the weather station to see how well that corresponds. Linked with all of this, I'd like you to look at the groundwater. And I'd like you to plot up the groundwater to look at the storage change. The other thing I'd like you to do is to determine a water level duration curve for the groundwater. And I'm gonna give you a number of locations where you will have continuously logged water level data. You need to take that data set and then look at the frequency at which the water level is above a particular, uh, the water table is, a, is within, let's say 10 centimeters of the ground surface, for example, within a given distance. And you're gonna plot that up as a groundwater duration curve. Okay, so I wish you well with that. You will have a month to do this as a group exercise. And at the end of that, I want a group report submitted. And remember that everybody in the group will get the same marks. So it's really up to you to basically get your team work together and get your act together. Good luck.